Vecher. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very sorry, but Dobro Vecher is the only I know in Slovenia. <coughs> so I will continue in English, the same as what Ace said. If I go too fast, if it's not clear, please just wave and I'll elaborate on it. First of all, I would like to thank Euros, Erasm, and all of you to give me the opportunity to be here. It's the first time I've been or I am at Slovenia and it has been until now fantastic. So thank you very much. I want to talk about this, what I believe um, is the most important thing for us as sailplane pilots. We have some problems with our sport, we have difficulties. But I think if you and I follow this, this never stop exploring and show passion for our sport, then we will grow and we will continue. Before we do that, we have to go back some hundred, twenty something years to our good friend Otto. We owe our sport to this man. He owed his life to it. And you see his biggest flight was 25 meters. Just a couple of years later, before World War I, this young Russian lady flew 749 kilometers in a glider, which looked like this, a road front 7 glide angle of less than 30, but on the back seat, you can see it had a huge water tank, 120 liters of water in this old wooden glider. It's incredible. 2003, this is where we are now. This is Argentina. Famous Klaus Ullmann in front of the volcano Lanin after his 3,000 kilometer flight. What will we, we will be able to do in 2050? We don't know, of course, but I will say there are no limits. But still, <coughs> we hear this voice all the time, everywhere. The old days were the good days, old times were better. Maybe it's true. This is what we have today. Airspace, which is incredible. I come from Belgium. Anyone has seen those maps, those airspace maps over there? It's insane. We only are able to fly with transponder. This is, of course, very difficult and makes flying more expensive and more difficult. You've seen it this morning. We need checklists to figure out if our license is still valid. It's incredible, but we have to deal with these problems. Memberships. This is a Swiss membership charge where I'm flying right now. 1996, three and a half thousand members. 2011, thousand pilots less. I'm pretty sure everywhere in Europe this problem occurs. In my club we found a solution and we have rising memberships every year. I will talk a little bit about that later on. So the old times, they were better. Maybe not. This is what we have today. Our friend Otto could dream about weather charts <coughs> who say we can fly in the first hours 100 kilometers and at the end of the day we can do 600. These things are just developed in the last 15 years and they are tremendously useful. This data, everyone knows RASP, are available for free even though sometimes it looks that I made this way. <laughs> this is something what we use and what I do very thoroughly is preparation. I think life becomes much easier and we can deal with all of those issues and difficulties we have if we prepare ourselves. This is what we do for big wave flights in Austria and Switzerland. We take the the, the charts which are made by the, the German weather service and we put our flights on top of it before the flight and after the flight and the accuracy of those weather charts in wave situations are incredible this is just the beginning I'm dreaming of having this on my LX9000 or on my Zeus you of course have to implement it this is what my last wave flight was from uh, close to Zurich where I take off 
seven and a half thousand meters was a, a 800 kilometer out and return flight and because of the transponder in the aircraft, I'm capable of doing this. We have huge aircraft space problems, but due to the transponder, the controller had no problem to get to, to lifting me up at 7,500. I mean, daylight was short, so I continued, but wave went up until 11,000 meters probably, if you see, if you look at those clouds. But still, you have to use the possibilities. That was at the very same flight. At a certain moment, the controller asked me, uh, Delta, Kilo, Bla, Bravo, something, are you capable of staying above 7,000 meters? I got slightly worried, but I said yes. Ten seconds later, this guy, this, this guy passed below me. So everything is possible if we prepare ourselves, if we get used to those things. Another thing, we started this way, Friend Otto had nothing, then it started this and made a huge development and now we are here from a famous manufacturer from Slovenia. All of those things are just improving more and more. This is what I'm looking forward to in the next competitions, having rain radar, uh, rain radar uh, images on my screen. And something else, this is what we do in my club. We have all generations, we have got pilots from 20 years until 70 years old. The 70 year old guy texts or WhatsApp or Facebooks to the 20 years old to is someone capable to fly on the wave day on this Tuesday. I'm ready to tow. We've got a fantastic communication in our club and memberships are rising and at the same time we developed a special concept. Or everywhere else in Europe, memberships are declining, and we said to ourselves, how we can, can we change this? We developed the concept that we just do cross-country flying. We have an agreement with another club in our, in our airfield. They do all the training, they're specialized in this, they're very good at it, and they love it. In my club, we only do cross-country and competition flying. The club which has the, the training is growing every year, and we too, we are growing every year. If this year we had six pilots who went to European Championships. It's not possible for every club to do this, but I think if we start trying to look for niche markets we can position ourselves into, then we can still grow and attract new and young members. You all know this guy. We had friend Otto. This is friend Icarus, of course. And I think he loved those wings he made. It's beautiful. But I think as well that he would have loved the new Ventus wings or the new Jonker's wings, wings much more. <laughs> Maybe even with a small turbo on the back. That this would not have happened to him. The good days were beautiful, but the, thing, the days we have today are at least equally as nice as what was before. We've got tons of those hidden treasures. I mean, it's the short flights we all know. You start in the afternoon on a Sunday, three hour flight, very local, which, which makes life beautiful. This is a, a flight I made to the coast, to Calais. I could see the English coast on the other side. It was very unexpected. It was not really planned, but it's beautiful to have those small moments. A flight in spring with beautiful spring cover, last uh, bits of snow, the, the Como Lake, beautiful convergence lines, everything is possible, even if you want to have a short flight. And maybe it's just to test what the scale of Schempir thermometer can do. It goes up to minus 20 and then it stops. It's those lucky hits, those, those small flights which are beautiful in our sport. And therefore, for me, it's very clear. I always try to go flying. Every opportunity. I mean, I've got a busy life at, at, at my job. I've got lots of things to do. But I'll try to use every moment. Like this on a, on a competition day, which was cancelled. You can see why, of course. It's in the southern part of Germany. And uh, I decided to fly anyway. Every, I'm not sure if some people have been there already, but this is what this, this area looks like. You've got uh, small ridges, but nothing which, which goes continuously where you could fly all the way. 
And normally people use those ridges to fly on short things, like here is an airfield on top, they can fly here, but it's very rare that people can go the entire ridge. And if it works, it's with northwesterly wind, and that day we had purely westerly wind, which went most parallel to the ridges, and it was quite weak, 15 to 20 kph of wind, which is, as you all know, not a lot. This is what it looked like today in the beginning. It was uh, cumulus clouds start falling apart, and mostly I was this high above the ridge, two to 300 meters, but everything went accordingly to plan. In the beginning, I still had cumulus clouds and, and thermals. A couple of hours later, it looked like this. And you see this same airfield on top of the ridge. You see what I'm aiming for? I want to try to use the ridge lift. And I have to fly 100 kilometers back home with 15 kph of wind, almost parallel to the wind. <coughs> with lots of patience, it took me three hours. It's my worst average ever, 33 kph of average, over 100 kilometers. I realized that everything is possible. You see the incoming front with rain underneath it already there, but still the ridges carry this ventus slowly over the area. And the beautiful part of those flights is you're so low, you can see everything in great detail. Our sport is incredible, I love it. I mean, this is beautiful. Finally, somehow the glider carried me home, and I could go, I could put it away in his covers, and good to go for a good beer. This is what a sport can be like in a, in a Sunday afternoon for a short flight. <coughs> it brings me to cross-country flying. I really love making big distances. I love the small local flights as well, but this is what I really am passionate about is cross-country flying and in the, in the next step, competition flying. But let's talk about this. We are lucky. All young pilots in this room are lucky. 50 years ago, Competition pilots, cross-country pilots, kept their secrets for themselves. Today, you read this book, it's about 25 years old, maybe 30 already right now, right now from the famous Helmut Reichman, if you're into cross-country flying, and then you read Leo Enrique Brigliadori's um, Competing in Gliders, and you know everything about competitions as well. Everything is written down, all top pilots are available, and you can talk to them. These people, were the ones who were very important for me. My family is a gliding family, so I, I, have, I have a little bit of an advantage, of course, for, compared to people who didn't have a, a parent or something who did that. But competition-wise, Leonardo Brigliadori was, was the guy who, who said to me that I'm capable um, for winning a world championship. He said, he said to me, after losing one, that I just had to keep on going and I will make it a certain time. And he got right. A couple of years later, I realized that everything is possible if you believe in it. The other guy, very famous, you can see his smile, he's always like that, is Klaus Ullmann. I don't know him very, very well. I had the opportunity to make two or three flights with him. But he's a guy who told me and he showed me his, his passion and his creativity. Sometimes, he sits at the shore or at a little, a little lake or, or something and he sees, he looks at what the waves are doing. Because everything what, which is happening over there, which is visualized in those waves, is exactly the same as what happens in, 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 in the sky. So you've got those huge front lines, those waves, who get disturbed by mountains, by continents. You've got smaller scale Lee effects behind this little almost mountain, and then you've got the microscopic, small-scale uh, perturbances, this, those turbulence. It's exactly the same as what we experience in the sky. This is a radar image, it's an island, that's another island, and two more islands over here. You can see exactly the same things which can, we can see on a small scale in, in a river or in a, in a lake happen in the sky. And he showed me, if you, if you use your imagination, everything is possible and he has a world record with 3,000 kilometers so he knows what he's talking about. So we come back to this preparation thing. I think for me mentally gliding is, is a mental game. We can all thermal, we can all fly straight ahead. The gliding part is a mental thing if you want to fly big.
big distances to want to fly competitions. So for me, I've got a system, I prepare every flight as good as I can. If I fly into the mountains and in the flatlands as well, I know exactly I will thermal here. If this doesn't work, I will go here, or I will go here, or I will go here. I have all the options in different wind conditions. By studying OLC flights from some, some other pilots, by having experience, and I update my preparations all the time. And it keeps my mental capabilities in the flight uh, up to date, so I can spend the time using it for different things. One of those examples is a, is a flight I made last year. I declared a 1000 kilometer FAI triangle uh, with a discus in the southern part of Germany. And the um, situation was in April, so still quite short days. You can see uh, Zurich over here, Munich is there. And this is the typical triangle uh, which is flown in the southern part of Germany, mostly with open glass gliders. The weather situation was quite, quite difficult because we had a front on this part which was moving from northwest to southeast. And the weather, phenomena, uh, the weather chart said that Zurich would, sti would still have a, a clear spot and it would improve during the day. But due to the, the, the mountains which blocked the front, I didn't believe it. So at Wednesday I started calling friends all over the Schwabian Alp. I knew I had to start in this area. Um, and I started calling them. Could I, can I start at your place? Can you give me a takeoff? And because it was April, it was quite soon in the season, quite early in the season, most of those clubs were still closed or wet runways. There was no, uh, no tow plan, so I spent four or five hours calling around. Finally, Blaubeuren, in a very small airfield, some four hours drive from Zurich, said, you can come, of course, we have got the capacity and we will start to fly. So um, I had to plan the flight, and because of a northeasterly wind, I wanted to have tailwind in the morning, fly towards this area, but the problem was of course the front which was still lying there. I was quite unsure, so I couldn't go too far south. Then back up north all the way, this is the famous Wasserkuppel where uh, the, ma the flying really started for all of us. This Wasserkuppel, and then all the way down along this ridge, to southeastern Germany and back to Blauboren, Blauboren, hopefully with some tailwind. And you can see the turn point in the morning was quite close to what, uh, what was possible. A little bit more south would not have been possible and all the rest of the flight was very easy. Beautiful <coughs> cumulus and in the end some tailwind. This is what it looked like. I woke up this the morning at 3 o'clock in the morning I told to Barbara, my girlfriend, I'm going to go flying. Flying it was raining totally. She said, you're crazy, but the glider was there. So I went, took the car, drove four hours. And at 9.30 at the morning at Laborin, it looked like this. First cumulus, quite low. I was a tow at 9.45. First very nice cloud street, 700 meters above the ground. Um, but it was very easy, of course. We had a tailwind, first leg was an average of 145 something at 10 o'clock in the morning. And then the difficulty started a bit. The black forest, the clouds were 400 meters above the ground. Outlanding possibilities are not so easy over there, so we had to fly quite careful. And I lost a bit of time. But then after that, you can see it's just fantastic weather. Very good climbs and progress was good. This is on the second leg, you see it's April, last bits of snow, and uh, this is the Thuringer Wald, it's the best thermal part of, Ger of Germany. And then the final leg, that was the unfortunate part, the day died too soon. It got quite tricky, thermals were dead, but in the end, I just managed to make it home. With 50 meters above the ground, I could make a straight landing and I could finish the flight at sunset. And all of this was possible because of the, of the good and, and the planning. In the end, some ex unexpected things happened, but the flight itself was quite easy because I knew I was in schedule and the planning was, uh, was correct. Another flight which shows these preparation things 
was a flight we did with five gliders. We went from Zurich to almost the end of the Alps and back. So you can see Zurich over there, Maribor, Graz, Vienna is there, and the end of the Alps is here. And we declared a 500 kilometer out and 500 kilometer return. So 1000 K. And what happens in, in those wave flights we do in Switzerland, most of, most of the time with these sudden, strong sudden winds, the front comes from the west, and the wind is very strong in this area, and it weakens towards here. If the wind is here strong in this area, the front is already there, and we cannot fly anymore in Switzerland. So this day, we had to do things differently. I looked at the weather maps and I decided I would go high up in the morning, as high as possible, as high as allowed, 6,000 meters if possible, and we would just use the altitude and start flying thermally in this area for about 600 kilometers. So 300 and 300 and those 400 kilometers over there would have been in dynamic system, rich and wave. So the idea was to enter the thermals, fly there, fly back in thermals, enter the wave again, and fly home. This is in the morning, we prepared all the gliders. We were five pilots who declared this task. Two of them uh, flew a discus, I was flying this one. And this is what it looked like from 6,000 meters. The view towards the south, all the clouds uh, come from the south who are pushed with a strong southern wind, and the area where we entered the wave is clear of clouds. So our plan went very easily and very accordingly. We climbed to 6,000 meters, climbed one, climb one, once more to 6,000 meters, and entered and started the task. But still, if you start the task and the first turn point is 500 kilometers out, even if you got a good plan, it's still quite difficult. That's why you've got good friends for, we flew together, and we started this beautiful task. At a certain point we entered Austria, this is the famous Grimming mountain, and you can see the thermals were fantastic. This was very, very easy. And then we went back after the turn point, some 500 kilometers out, back and we tried to get into the, the, the wave uh, system. You can see some small rotor clouds already, some rotor clouds there, and this is the problem. This is the Inn Valley, the river Inn over here. Innsbruck is in this part, it's just behind the corner, and the wind is channeled into the valley, which makes it very difficult to enter the wave and to fly against a strong headwind, which is about 100 kilometers per hour strong. If you manage to get around the corner, the day is saved. And that's what it looked like. Fantastic lenticular clouds if you enter the wave again, beautiful rotors, and we knew at this point, 200 kilometers from the finish point, the flight was, was done. We could celebrate and fly into the sunset, and we could manage to fly the 5,000 K flights, and I had the honor of, of getting uh, three European records with this flight. But it's very easy if you plan the flight, then everything falls to get, comes together, and the flying was very, very straightforward. Another part, and this is what I like most is competition flying. I think it's great to come together with 120 pilots. It's uh, the famous Hanweide competition. Um, I think it's fantastic. You fly against each other in a good atmosphere. In the evening you drink a beer together. And um, it's where I learn the most. It's the same again. This is for me the important part. I prepare for a competition, and during the competition it's very relaxed for me. I rarely, maybe never have stress during a competition, because I know where the good thermals are, I know where I will fly in a certain type of weather. I also prepare. If we have a turn point over here, can I go there? We were at the World Championships 2014, and we were in a situation, I was leading the competition, I was in first place of the world, and it was a situation where we had to cross a big, big forest, with one thermal in the middle of the forest, 
and it's a difficult position because you, you want to cross the forest and at that moment you said, no, we won't do this. I mean, I want to go to a competition, I will, I'm willing to take certain risks, but I'm not flying in an area where I cannot land, crash, maybe even die. So you have to set your limits and that's what I try to do in my preparation. Same is for finish lines. Can I land in these places? Or is it a finish uh, ring? Is it, is it safe to go in there and land somewhere over here? It's all of those things who make life very easy if you know where you go and if you prepare. That's what I love about competitions. It's a little bit of adventure which is left. <laughs> this is not fun at the moment itself, but afterwards, of course, a great story in the bar. Let me talk a little bit about Reiskala. Reiskala is uh, Finland, as you all know. It's very far north, so you have incredibly long days. The daylight goes from 3 in the morning until 11 in the evening, so you've got days, thermal days which are very long and 1000k flights happen very often over there. This is what Finland is typically known for. Fantastic cumulus clouds, big lakes and even bigger forests. And this is what it looked like. The training week 2014, the shoreline of Finland, isn't it beautiful? I mean, we are so lucky that we can see those things from the sky. My brother was there in 2010, I think, in the World Championship for Juniors, and they had 600 kilometer flights every day. And he talked and he said, it's fantastic, it's incredible, we have to go there. I can tell you, it's lies, damn lies. 21st of June, it's snowing in Finland. But if you got a good um, team which is organizing the competition and which stay cool in all of these situations, it's no problem at all. And I must say, we had not a lot of flying days. We had seven days in the end, but they did a fantastic job. And if you're well prepared and you've got a good atmosphere, everything is possible. <coughs> this is what the first competition day looked like. Cumulus clouds who look, well, yeah, you can see for yourself, snow showers, rain showers everywhere. But still, I was second in the first day, I had a good position in the, in the second day, and I already thought, this is what's going to happen. I will take the big cap home, I will be world champion. Of course, it's not that easy. Everyone around you wants to become world champion, so I dropped. I became a little bit arrogant, and I said, I can do this, this is easy. I dropped on the third day from first position to 11th. Competition over, basically. And then it's what a good team around you makes, makes all worthwhile. We were a small team from Belgium, it uh, was a family team. My father was a mental coach, an experienced pilot, Bar and a meteorologist for, for the team. Barbara made sure that we were happy, that uh, everything was good. My mom was a team captain and my brother was a team partner. So we know each other very well and that makes it a little bit easier and I truly believe that is what made the advantage compared to other teams. If you've got good friends, family or whatever around you, things get a little bit more easy. But still, we had lots of days wasted, we were gritting in the rain, it looked more or less like this for four or five days in a row. And we, we knew we had to have lots of days to fly, to come back from 11th at least until the podium. But luckily, Barbara, completely in pink, it's raining, it's 80 kph of wind, but she's still smiling and making my life as a pilot easy. So we had to come back, and this is the day when everything uh, went well again. It was a wave day. It was, Finland is completely flat. You can see cloud streets, 80 kph of wind, and lenticular clouds on top of it. A couple of pilots, <coughs> amongst them the Belgian team, my brother and myself, but of course Sebastian Kawa, the, um, the English pilots, all the ones who were fighting for the title, were there with us. We climbed up into the wave. In the end we were here at the lenticular cloud and made it around the task with just three pilots. So that meant back from 11 up until the second place 
and everything was to play for again. The problem was the pilot in front of me, Sebastian Kawa, the unbeatable one. Ten world, uh, ten world titles, so I was thinking a podium place is already very nice, but somehow we managed to go into the last day with eight points in front of Sebastian. I can tell you I'm a very calm guy in the cockpit, I don't get nervous, but if I have 45 seconds advantage in front of Sebastian Kawa and his three teammates, I didn't sleep very well. And I was quite nervous at flight. So we discussed tactics, everything involved. Do we follow Sebastian? Do, you, do we not follow him? In the end, we didn't follow him. We started on the best, on the last day, the best day of the competition, all together. The two English guys, the two Belgian pilots, and the three Polish pilots as well. So we were two pilots to control five other pilots who all could be able to win the title. I can tell you it was the most exciting race of my life, but it's very easy to understand, of course. They were in front, we were in front, it was like this all the time. But in the end, we all started together, and we all finished together. So, that made me the lucky guy. I was the first Belgian pilot to have the, the, the cup, but in the end, it was not my title. For me, it truly, I truly believe this title was the title of the team. We all deserved it, we all fought, fought for it, and I think that is what makes this sport so beautiful in competitions. We can all be a champion if you got the right partners, the right team pilots, and everything uh, around it. Let me come to the, the last part. It's the adventure part. Besides flying competitions, I think we have the opportunity and the, and the luck that we have one of those sports where we have um, unbelievable possibilities. We can fly from here to the coast, which is, which is incredible. If you start here in Serbia and you fly to the coast, you see all those ships, you can fly to Croatia, from Switzerland, I can fly to the southern part of France. There are not so many sports who can do that. And it doesn't matter, I mean, this was a flight, 145 kph of wind, there were some, some guys I was, I was quite comfortable in the, in the glider, but there were some guys climbing this mountain in 145 kph of wind. I thought they were crazy, but they looked down on me and I said, you're crazy, but it's, it's fantastic. Or this part, we went flying into Morocco, and by coincidence, the solar impulse was there, was in Warsazate, and my father and I got promoted to camel supervisor. <coughs> there are not so many sports where you can find all of these beautiful things. Crossing of the Gotthard mountain. It was raining on the northern side of the Alps. We flew very low over the, over the Gotthard and on the other side beautiful cumulus clouds. Wire screwing. Ace can read this. This is South Africa. Lions in this area. We had to cross this gate every day to go to the airfield. But let's talk about this. This is a little paradise which I'm very grateful that I know some very nice Slovenian <coughs> glider pilots. He's somewhere around here, Andre, I think you call Zico over here. He's the one who told me about Little Namibia. This is incredible and you're so lucky that you can go there in a couple of hours of drive. It doesn't look like this anymore, I've been told. It has a concrete runway right now. It's a small city, it's beautiful. They're very friendly people, and the flying is just insane. <laughs> of course, this is insane as well. You need some thorough briefing, you need some preparation again, but it has been a fantastic experience to fly there. Look at this. Look at this. I mean, this is four to five meters everywhere. And this is a flight uh, Bastian Brischabek made, 1,000 kilometers, very nearby. <laughs> And I wasn't there on that flight, but I can only assume it looked a little bit like this. Cloud base 4,600 meters above sea level. Climb rates, I don't know, four, five, six meters per second, just insane. And you live a six hours drive away from there. Namibia is not here, you can go to Namibia, it's very nearby. The beautiful canyon which goes to, to Mostar in this area. My brother 
flying the, the glider, we, we got uh, from, from the local pilots fantastic final glides in the sunset. The lake nearby, and above all, the friendship. Those people were so friendly. We were there, we were welcomed, we were there for just three days, and they helped us with everything, and it was just an incredible experience. I truly believe this is, this is true. We have no limits in our sport. We have regulations, we have everything. It's, it's very difficult, it becomes more difficult. But with a little bit of creativity and some passion for gliding, you can go everywhere. Whether you want to fly above the famous Matterhorn mountain underneath a little cumulus cloud, or if you want to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and watch the sunrise, or if maybe you want to go to the Eiffel Tower as a turn point, everything's possible. Maybe you want to experience seven meter climbs or go to the unknown Kamchatka. If someone wants to help me get there and you come with me, we can organize this. Or maybe you want to be on the podium of the very first uh, World Gliding Ch Championship selfie. I truly believe in our sport everything is possible and the best things still have yet to come. Thank you for your attention.